All right, I know a lot uh, of uh, the videos I make are like anti-Trump videos, anti-GOP videos, etc. Well, guess what? It's time for an anti-Clinton video. Chris Wallace is going to interview Joel uh, Benenson, who is uh, one of the chief campaign strategists for Hillary Clinton. And I'm going to be honest with you. It's guys like this that make me sick, where they sit there, duck and dodge, and basically lie for the uh, person that they're working for. Now, I'm going to play uh, this particular interview. And this guy, basically, he, he basically just tries to spin his way out of what the DNC uh, did to uh, Bernie Sanders. He, he's, he's full of shit because, honestly, I believe that if the DNC had been a uh, fair arbiter uh, as far as the process is concerned, Bernie Sanders might have actually won. Now, he cut his own throat by not uh, really uh, getting down into um, the southern states and giving her a big lead there. And he was screwed as far as the uh, superdelegates were concerned. But he might have been even more competitive if he had decided to basically, and I'm not going to say fight dirty, but just get down there into the southern states and cut the margin that she beat him by, you know, to, you know, if, if he could have just cut it by 10 points, uh, it would have been a hell of a lot more competitive. But, you know, when you lose like 70, you know, 70, 75 to 25, you know, you're allowing somebody to build up you know, a, a bunch of delegates that you're going to have a hell of a hard time coming back for. If he could have just cut it down to 60 to 40, we might be talking about a contested convention right now. Anyway, here's the interview with uh, Chris uh, Wallace and uh, Joel Benenson. What message do Democrats hope to send voters this week? Joining me now, the chief strategist for the Clinton campaign, Joel Benenson. And Joel, welcome to Fox you, News Sunday. Thanks for having me. Let's start with the big news this weekend. Why Tim Kaine? Well, I think Hillary Clinton made clear from the beginning that her number one priority was to pick a vice president who was ready to do all parts of the job of president. Uh, Tim Kaine has that experience. He's been a mayor, a governor, a senator on the Armed Services Committee. He brings that part of the package. The other piece I think that's really important is she wants a real partner who can help her produce the real results that are going to make a real difference in people's lives. That's going to be key to this campaign. American people want action. They want their economic lives uplifted. Tim Kaine brings the same values to the job that she does, and that will be a very powerful combination in trying to get Washington working for working people again. But the See, and that's the problem. She picked somebody that thinks exactly like she does, and the progressive uh, wing of the party is ticked off about that. Also, um, Tim Kaine is uh, heavy into uh, the the uh, on the side of the banking industry, and they point out that uh, he did a lot of uh, work for uh, uh, people that were being discriminated against in the uh, various housing industries uh, in Virginia. But I invite anybody that's watching this to look up something called Project Exile. Project Exile. Okay, it had to do with uh, convicted felons and illegal guns. That's all I'm going to say about it, so you need to go in and do your own research, and that uh, will give you what I believe to be a fair hearing on how Mr. Uh, Kane uh, has handled, quote unquote, uh, some uh, racial uh, issues as far as sentencing is concerned. There are some real differences on issues between Clinton and Kane, and I want to go through a few sure. of them. Kane praised TPP, the Pacific Trade Deal. Clinton opposes it. Kane wants to ease some regulation of banks under Dodd-Frank. He supports the Hyde Amendment, which bars the use of federal Medicaid funds for abortion. And as governor, he backed requiring parental consent. 
for minors seeking abortion. Those are some differences. Yeah, there are some differences, and in their conversations, uh, they talk through those differences. Um, and when you talk about Tim Kaine, keep in mind, you raise some issues. He's got a 100% rating from Planned Parenthood in NARAL. He is a Catholic, a practicing Catholic, and he has personally said he's opposed to abortion. But he's also said Roe v. Wade is the law of the land, and it shouldn't be changed. And he has been 100% for protecting a woman's right to choose and a right to her own health care. Uh, on some of these other issues, like TPP, uh, Hillary Clinton is uh, confirmed in her choice that her criteria for trade deals being met is they have to protect American workers, protect jobs, make sure that they don't reduce wages, that they raise wages in America and protect our national security. She is confident that Tim Kaine is in line with her on making sure that any trade deal that this administration engages in will meet those criteria. But, but let me pick up on that because sure. this is the kind of thing that I think a lot of people don't like about politicians. Just three days ago, here's what Tim Kaine said about TPP, the Pacific Trade Deal. He said, I see much in it to like. Yesterday, after Clinton named him, he suddenly announced he's opposed to TPP. Well, look, but Hillary Clinton said there were things she liked about it, too, along the way. You've got to remember, things changed in the final provisions, Chris, that were very critically uh, 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 negative towards uh, American interests. Notably, one big one is the nation of origins provision. Changes who has to own how much of a business to qualify as a Vietnamese company or a Malaysian company. So I don't think there's any inconsistency there. Nobody said this thing is terrible in every I and T that's been dotted and crossed, there were things in it that were good for a while, and Hillary Clinton thought and talked about them, and then at the end of the deal, it didn't meet her tests. All right, let's talk about the other big issue as you get into this convention, and I suspect you know what I'm gonna talk about. Some Bernie Sanders supporters upset about Kane because they think that he's too centrist, but what they're really upset about was a WikiLeaks release on Friday of thousands of DNC emails, which seemed to show that the DNC was favoring Clinton over Sanders. And we want to put some of those emails up on the screen. In early May, the DNC's finance chief, for Kentucky and West Virginia, can we get someone to ask his belief? Does he believe in a god? He had skated on saying he has a Jewish heritage, I think I read, he is an atheist. In late May, a Democratic spokesman suggested pushing a story that Sanders never ever had his act together, that his campaign was a mess. And responding to Sanders' criticism in April, DNC Chair Debbie Wasserman Schultz wrote, spoken like someone who has never been a member of the Democratic Party. Now, we've talked to some people in the Sanders camp, they're furious. Uh, Trump is uh, tweeting out, maybe there's going to be a Philly fight. And there is also a report now that Debbie Wasserman Schultz is not going to speak at this convention. First of all, is that true? Well, I saw the same report. You said I've been sitting here with you for the last few minutes, so I, I can't give a definitive answer on that. See, now he's full of shit because uh, that information was out uh, there uh, yesterday that they had, number one, uh, removed Debbie Wasserman Schultz from uh, giving a uh, speech at the DNC convention, and number two, that Marsha Fudge, uh, House of Representatives, Ohio, was going to gavel uh, the uh, conference uh, into order. So he's full of shit as far as not knowing what was going on because Hillary Clinton, her people are now actually in full control of the uh, DNC convention. So for him to say he doesn't know, he's a lying ass. Uh, as to the other things, you know, first of all, I believe the gentleman who uh, sent that email uh, has apologized, and I want to make about Sanders religion. And I want to make very clear: you know, Hillary Clinton has been a, a woman of faith her whole life. She was raised a Methodist, uh, believes very strongly in, in, in the creed of her faith. Uh, we don't believe anybody's religion should ever be an issue in any campaign. Absolutely. But not. how about the and larger fact, issue, Joe, so, which is just the idea that all of this seems to show not just one, but all three emails, and there were others that the DNC had its thumb on the scale favoring Clinton over Sanders, which is what Look, we've, we've seen, all we've seen, let's keep in mind that what happened here is most experts on cybersecurity say this was a hack by actors, bad actors, in concert with Russia, and working in concert with Russia. We don't know what's in 20,000 emails. We know about three emails. Uh, we don't know anything else that's been... Okay, so he's seriously going to try to deflect by uh, saying that it... it talking about it being a hack. What the hell is it being ha being a hack have to do with the fact that uh, the information is credible? 
because one guy, which he's going to acknowledge, has already apologized for his statements. And number two, now he's going to say, well, uh, we've only seen three. Hell, if we see 20 and we see 20, you know, obviously all 20,000 emails aren't going to be uh, in relationship to Bernie Sanders. But if the majority of the uh, emails that are in relation to Bernie Sanders are all negative uh, as these as negative as these three were, what the hell are you going to say then? See, this is a guy being in disingenuous. If he had come out it the other way, that, that we had nothing to do with it, and we're appalled from what we've seen and called it a day there, you know, he might have had a little bit more credibility. But right, as far as I'm concerned, he's got none. Sit inside the DNC. What we know about the course of our primary system is uh, close to 30 million people voted. They voted in open primaries. We had independents voting. We had Democrats voting. Uh, they were, it was a wide open contest. 30 million people voted and Hillary Clinton won vast majority of delegates, 54% of delegates. She won 54% now, of I understand she won, but did the DNC have its thumb on the spear? I think the DNC will conduct a full review of all these emails, all these emails that were being apparently selectively leaked by these actors acting in concert with Russia. That's a serious problem that we have to be concerned with. If they're no, notice how he's taught, he always tries to throw in uh, actors in concert with Russia. The question was that the DNC have their thumb on the scale. The answer is yes, and you, you fuck, you don't want to admit it. Kind of trying to meddle in what was what we believe was a fair and honest election. What was fair about it if they had their thumb on the scale? That's bullshit. Okay? Y yeah. I mean, it's over. He's lost. He's admitted he's lost, and he's going to support Clinton. You guys should at least have the balls to admit that uh, you know he was fighting an uphill battle with damn near everybody against him, and he still got close. The D and everybody knew Debbie Wasserman Schultz was up. Bernie Sanders asked from the moment that he declared until he finally uh, uh, has, you know, has suspended, obviously, his campaign and is supporting Clinton. But you could see it. Everything she did, every decision she made, it always favored the Clintons and it always went against Bernie Sanders. Stevie Wonder saw that. I think there's no so question that this is Russia trying I think when 30 million people vote through the primary system, uh, a, a near historic number, the second most in history, and they ballots were counted at the ballot box, and Hillary Clinton got 16 million votes, the third highest total in history, second only to herself and Barack Obama. Okay. I think these elections were fair. I think that... Yeah, you're the only one that thinks they were fair, because if that information had come out early on, she might not have gotten 16 million votes. Bernie might have got 16 million votes because number one, he was the underdog, and every you know, and uh, the establishment was shooting against him. And if there's one thing that we love in America, it's an underdog. And he would have might have gotten a lot more votes than he had if uh, all the dirt had come out as to what the DNC uh, was uh, doing against him. So that's bullshit. They should wait for the review, the full review of this, and not jump to any conclusions on any sides well, based on... I mean, the fact that the finance chair was a pop to a apologize would seem to indicate that that was an accurate email. Well, if the finance chair apologized, then the finance chair should. But the notion of whether the elections were rigged, I think that that, when 30 million people vote and cast no, no, their no, votes... I, let, me get, let me make it clear. Yeah. I don't think the election was rigged. Okay, so we rigged. Should, I, <laughs> But the question is whether the DNC favored Clinton over Sanders. Well, it's a different uh, issue. Uh, the, the issue here is these primaries are largely fought out on the ground with voters. The DNC's impact in these things is minimal compared to the results. What candidates and campaigns spend and do on the ground, talking to voters day in and day out, that's what determines who wins. Let me, let me just say. See, and that's a bunch of crap because if you recall, there was a situation where the uh, various databases were opened up now, the Sanders people, they came to the DNC and let them know about the vulnerability within the uh, firewalls that were between the uh, databases. Not once, but twice. The second time that they notified them, Debbie Wasserman Schultz shut them out of access to the database, and they had to get, go to court in order to uh, get access again. And that was at a key time uh, before the uh, new, I believe it was the either the, it was probably the Iowa uh, 
caucuses or it was after the New Hampshire uh, primaries, but it was in that period of time. So for you to say that the DNC did not have a major effect at the very beginning of the uh, campaign season, that's a bunch of crap. Incidentally, and we were assured by the DNC that we wouldn't have what happened last week at the RNC, that they wouldn't do sound checks, but every convention we've done, they do sound checks. So if you hear some extraneous noise, one last question in this area. Does Hillary Clinton still have full confidence in Debbie Wasserman Schultz, the DNC chair, and will she stay in her job? Can you assure us she will stay in her job through the election? I, I honestly have never had a conversation with Hillary Clinton about uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz and the chair. Yeah, like I really believe that. He knows everything. This guy has got his complete thumb on the Clinton campaign. He's Clinton's chief strategist, so he knows everything that's going on. So he knows that they have walked as far away from Debbie Wasserman Schultz as humanly possible. They're the Democratic Party, so uh, I, I, that, that, that's the honest truth, Chris. I've never had that conversation, so I can't sit here and assure you of anything. I think that there are reports out today that say she may not speak in the convention. That'll be up to her and whoever she's talking to about her role. But the Clinton camp hasn't asked for her not to. I, I've been, I haven't been engaged in any of those conversations regarding that. Do you worry? How is the chief strategist not involved in any conversations with, with her? Th this guy is a liar. He's a liar. This could disrupt the convention? No, I don't. I think we've got a lineup that's extraordinary. We've got, as you said at the top, uh, I think you're going to see a strong contrast between the disunity, the divisiveness, the anger, and, and borderline hate coming out of the Republican convention here. I think we've got a positive affirmative message about how we create an economy that works for everybody. We're going to be talking about how the strength of America is in our unity, our diversity, and the fact that we've always been at our best when we lift people up, not when we lift each other up, not when we tear each other apart. I want to ask you about one controversy about your convention on thursday night you're going to feature uh, what's called the mothers of the movement a group of, of mothers and other victims uh, uh, uh relatives of victims of police shootings why well look i think that these women have been um suffered a tragic loss uh we haven't released our full program yet about the range of things we're talking about but we've been talking about the need and hillary clinton has led the conversation on this to have both respect for our police and we've seen tragic shootings in dallas and baton rouge obviously and respect between police and communities and i think people in the police uh field law enforcement field agree with that nobody's happy when the communities and the police are not working together to solve crime but but here's these, the, these, yeah. Okay, the answer to the question is they're pandering for the black vote. Okay, that's the answer. It was stupid of them to announce uh, those three mothers. Uh, uh, God, God knows I had deep respect for them and for their loss, but it was stupid of them to announce that those three mothers are going to be speaking uh, before the DNC without having a counterbalance or uh, police chiefs favorable to their the de democratic point of view also speaking and I'm not talking about somebody like uh, uh, asshole Sheriff Clark out of uh, uh, Minnesota or um, the police chief uh, I forget the, he's a union guy out of uh, Cleveland I don't want any kind of radical uh, nut uh, that's anti Black Lives Matter I, but there are various police chiefs and officers around the country that uh, they could have gotten. Now, most of them are probably Republicans, but they could have uh, even picked the uh, police chief out of Dallas because they have really uh, stepped up their game and uh, knocked down um, a lot of the issues uh, that uh, they used to have uh, with the community. But back to the original uh, deal, they're pandering. They're pandering. They're doing exactly the opposite of what the uh, Republican Party did by having uh, all the law enforcement uh, people that they had uh, speaking uh, before their uh, convention. Go ahead. Well, no, I was just going to say, but here's why I bring it up. Philadelphia, this city's police union, says it is, quote, insulted by the exclusion of police widows and police family members. And it, they say that you're... you're talking to the victims of the shootings, but not to the victims of the of the police who were assassinated. They say when eight cops were assassinated in the last few weeks, why aren't you honoring them? Well, 
and they got a point okay if you if you want to be even-handed they do have a point they should have well normally what Fox does that's going to give a fairly moderate point of view so that uh, you don't have a raving lunatic jumping up there talking to uh, people that are not going to be receptive to the message first of all I respectfully with the the police officers in Philadelphia like all of our law enforcement officials have a very tough job we have not released our full program yet as you know there are many uh, uh, events that, and speakers, the majority of which have not been released yet. That will happen uh, in, in, the, in the forthcoming future. So I guess you're saying that you're going to have some uh, police officers or family members of slain police up there. You better because uh, you're going to suffer some heavy duty criticism if you don't. But these women have been on a campaign to talk about the relations between police and their communities. The communities that suffer the highest crime in the country, who want to be protected, who know that their law enforcement people are there in their communities to protect them. But they're speaking up because they also suffer tra tragic losses of children, husbands, fathers who have been shot, and that's painful for them. And what they're trying to do is take their loss and turn it into activism to be part of the conversation to improve these relations with police and community. We've got a couple of minutes left. I want to change subjects. So at his convention this last week, Donald Trump, I think you would agree, hammered Hillary Clinton. Here's a taste of that. This is the legacy of Hillary Clinton. Death, destruction, terrorism, and weakness. Clinton was already trailing by eight points among men and by 15 points among whites. What does your polling show? Honestly, did Donald Trump get any bounce out of his convention? Well, honestly, we haven't polled during the convention because it's not, a, it's not an opportune time to do that. But what I can tell you as an observer and a student, not just of conventions and elections, but really of swing voters, that's kind of been my sweet spot as a pollster, Chris. I think your goal at your convention is you have to speak to people who are accessible to you and not with you yet. You have to persuade them and convert them, and you have to speak to their values and their issues. I think that was a missed opportunity. Their chaos, their divisiveness left those people, I think, feeling very left out of a Republican Party, just like many Republicans felt left out of that party. You had the governor of the host state not attend the convention. You've had the past two nominees of the party not attend that convention. They had an opportunity to show some unity, and instead they ended up showing divisiveness within their uh, speaking about the American people and a divided party at its core right now. Finally, you look at the numbers, I assume every day, the numbers you get. How close is this race, especially in the swing state? Yeah. Well, we, we don't poll every day, Chris. We're, we, well, no, but you we will at some point, but we don't, just to be clear. Look, I think the history of presidential elections is that they're very close. You know, we've only had a handful of presidents who've been elected with 50% of the vote on their re-election and uh, on their election and re-election. So you expect these things to be in a kind of, you know, three to six or seven point range. You know, we uh, with President Obama, we won by seven with against Senator McCain and against Romney by about three and a half. I think we're going to stay in that range for a long time. I think we'll know better after the two conventions where this sits and who got a bounce and who really communicated and made the points with the voters they need to reach better. So in that three to six point range, where are you right now? We're in that range. Where? <laughs> three, five, seven? Talk to me after the two conventions. <laughs> All right. Would you do me one favor? When you leave here yes. now, will you ask them to stop now? <laughs> I'll right? do my best. I'll do my best. But we got to get the set finished, too. Joel, thank, thank you. You can wait till 10 o'clock. Thank you. Thanks for coming in on this very busy Great. week. Thank you. All right. For those of you who really aren't familiar with this guy, he used to be uh, part of the uh, Obama um, uh, election committee. And um, after um, you know, Obama uh, came through the second time and uh, Clinton made her formal announcement that uh, she was going to run, uh, Obama re released a bunch of his people because they didn't even really like Clinton, but he released a bunch of his people to go over and uh, work uh, for the uh, Clinton uh, uh, election uh, campaign. This is one of the guys. And I got to tell you, uh, this guy, you know, I thought he was a stand-up guy when he was working with Obama, but I don't know if, if he's changed his spots in order to be able to work with uh, Clinton, but it damn sure looks like it.